Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to see you all. And thanks for coming. I've enjoyed sharing a cup of coffee with you this morning. Did everybody get some coffee out here? You missed the coffee. <laughs> We will allow you to grab my hand a little bit. We won't have to. You know, sharing uh, is kind of important when we talk about adults. We're going to be sharing with you today some new works we've done for the adult beginner. We get uh, not only the kind of a redo, you might say, for Piano Adventures, Adult Piano Adventures 1 and 2, but we have a wonderful supplementary library now for you as well with the adult classics, adult popular as well as adult Christmas. Also, our steel book too is released, and it's in your hat. So you've got some books. Everybody have books in your hat? Who, does, who needs a pen? Raise your hand. And maybe uh, we can get some packs up here where they may be missed. I'll share that on the screen. If you don't have a pack, then call a lot if you have it. We also have our new Piano Adventures player app. So to introduce that, we actually have two showcases this uh, year. Uh, this one here focusing primarily on the adult, the fifth publications. And then on Tuesday afternoon, we have a showcase with the app. And I'm going to share some of my team with you. Uh, Nancy's in my team. We have Elizabeth Gutierrez who will join me this morning. And Tuesday afternoon, John Uphoff, our production manager and creative assistant, and one of the voices in my first piano event, is will be uh, introducing the app along with Nina from the David Piano Institute. Well, speaking of sharing, when we're teaching the adult, I always find that that adult is a relationship experience, isn't it? I could ask a, uh, a rhetorical question, say, how many of you here teach adults? But we're going to all raise our hand, right? So for under the rhetorical questions, how about if we give a very rhetorical question? How many of you are adults? <laughs> and that's a lot. How many of you are teachers? <laughs> Okay, now, for teachers and adults, what could be more natural than teaching adults? And I think this is actually rather profound and important in that we're teaching peer to peer. We may have the expertise in music, but our student has their expertise. Maybe an owner of a business, a CEO, maybe a doctor. But whatever they're doing, they have a zone of expertise that's equally valid. So we're talking person to person on a peer basis. So much like when we say, let's share this cup of coffee, teaching an adult is like sitting down in a conversation with a cup of coffee. If we think of it that way, we become much more effective than if we think, I'm the teacher, and this is the student, and I need to explain. So put explaining on the shelf, instead of bringing it in as conversation. I think the proof of that also is in our relationships with adult students. Have you found friendships for? I'm always amazed at how what good friends we need, a diverse set of people. And that's coming probably less due to the music, but more from the relationship that's formed through the conversation. So teaching an adult is all about the process. It's not the product that we want to make a virtuoso, but it's the process of making music, exploring music, right in the here and now together. And part of that experience is the learning, and that experience is talking about sharing with that learning. Our found book one, I just hope you hear the early pages, if you have it in your pack, you can grab the book one. And we're going to start with black keys, aren't we? So, instead of a big explanation, we're going to just talk about the black keys. And what do we notice, of course, is there's white and black keys, and we have these clusters of black keys. This is, the, the color is not important, but what's important is that it takes a set of 88 notes and we have repeated sets of patterns. We only have these small groups to learn. That's a rather profound concept, because it simplifies it. It takes away the overwhelm. We just have two repeating sets here across the keys. And what I like to talk about with a student is that the black and white isn't so important. But what else do we notice about these black keys? Yeah, they're raised, aren't they? They're higher. So now we can feel these keys. And this is what's really important, we feel our way around. This gives us a couple points here. One is that if you relax the wrist and drape our hand over, that's how we can feel the black key. So right away, we have the student relaxing all of the tension, like draping over and feeling the black. Also, if we're feeling the keys, then we're involved with touch, right? And just as we do with advanced students of dealing with touch and sound, with our adult student, we want to right away bring in a sense of touch 
They're operating it with the iron weight, and that's the iron weight because it's a softer sound. <coughs> so we're connecting this section of sound. I like to make this sound more than just saying listen. If we say listen, the student can't have to find my ears. I don't like, so it's hard to know how to listen. But what we want to do is let this sound resonate not just in the piano. We want to hear it resonate in the piano. Now we want that resonance to come through our whole body. So we're going to take that in. And then it becomes an experience of listening that's much more profound. For hundreds of years, that concept of letting that sound resonate in the instrument, resonate in the body, and resonate in the music of the spheres, the moon, and the heavens, and so on. This is a concept that's so foreign to us, but it was so profoundly accepted in the age of Pythagoras, and hundreds of years later, that it makes a sense of music, and music making more profound than just playing melodies. This is really interesting set of sound. Now, some of our students will relate to that, right? Some adults might say, wow, that's fascinating, and some not so much. What do we have with adults? I like to think of three categories of adults. Perhaps in your teaching you found you can't teach every adult the same, just like you can't teach every child the same. Because some students are philosophers. They love that kind of thing we were just talking about. You can talk, and they want to talk, they want to know all the detail about problems. They want to know all about data. But some aren't philosophers at all. Some are engineers. I am putting these in quotes. Did you ever have an engineer adult student? Oh, yeah. They're the software programmer type. We had one that played the Pac Minuet in the game where they decoded. Yup, yup, bum, 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 bum. It was everything just pertained to, you know, deciphering the code. So when you have an engineer type of student, we need to give explanation, but we also have to really get them in touch from the heart, get them in touch with the sound and music. So we're bringing this other dimension. And then the third category is the play. That's the student just wants to play the songs. And this one came home to me. I might have shared the story with you before. I was teaching an adult student, and I was getting deep into the music theory with her. And then she interrupts me. She goes, Randy, she goes, you don't understand. She's a lawyer. She goes, when I come home from work, I pour myself a glass of wine, I set it on my Steinway, and I just want to play songs. I could care less about all this other stuff. <laughs> And that was a very opportune time for dancing because we were writing the adult method at that point. And then we realized that so many of the students they just want to get into the plan. So with the adult end, it's the song, just the tunes. Let me uh, share with you how we can address that. We go right from talking about black keys, playing some black keys, but then now let's play some song, shall we? So we get the little piano player app here for a little sound. This is just black keys and then there's no notation yet.
surrounding our tree black is a set the CDE, but what interval does that outline for us? Notice on the next page we go right into the fact of that CDE outlines a third, so let's explore thirds. Turning the page ahead a little bit, warm up with seconds and thirds. So I take the students through the sounds of thirds and explore. Maybe we put a big bass note in the bottom. And let's listen to the sounds we get. Or if we wanted to throw in a compliment pattern again underneath it. Website and the player app correlation. So if you see the little film icon, that means there's a video, and then of course there's the uh, audio track. And at this point, I'd like to turn the stage over to Elizabeth Beecher as we take us through the world. Hey, thank you, Randy. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Texas. How many of you are not from Texas? Raise your hand. Woo, good. Welcome from a native Texan to me. I'm from San Antonio. I'm not originally from San Antonio. I live here. And on behalf of San Antonio Music Teachers, I'd like to welcome all of you to our fair city. I hope you enjoy it while you're here. You'll find that San Antonio is one of the friendliest cities in Texas. Sorry, the rest of the Texans. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you for joining us. I have been part of the Faber team for years and years now. Have been thoroughly enjoyed my work with Nancy and Randall Faber. And of course, you know, their materials sort of speak for themselves for a number of years now. I want to take it up here. Um, let me grab my notes. Um, right here, here we go. On uh, the adults, here we go. If you'll turn to unit two in your books, this is uh, page 28. One thing we can do with adults is that we can get to the staff immediately. With them. They're dying to learn how to read, most of them. And that's one of their, their chief goals when they come in as adults. They want to read music fluently. And of course, right here in the, in the uh, span of two pages, they get a good overview of the staff. And it's wonderful how they have them um, orient them to the staff here. Uh, so they understand the range of the keyboard in direct correlation to the grand staff. 
But of course, this isn't an area where they actually learn all the names of the notes, but it's just an orientation page for them to get acquainted with exactly what part of the keyboard correlates to that portion of the staff. And then moving on, this is your page 30 and 31. We can get right into rhythm with them. They can handle three, four, and four, four times this time and, and understand what's going on with it. But the, the idea here is not just to have them clap and count and understand three, four, and four, four, but to correlate it to this alphabet and arrange the keyboard if they're understanding at this point. So they get a sense of the two different meters very distinctly. A couple of different ways you can practice it with them is by reciting the alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, G on B1, A, B, C, D, versus perhaps the saying of uh, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And of course, the uh, immediate understanding of the change of the hands, down stems, up stems, and all of that. <clears throat> I've had some adults that look at this, and Randy was talking about the engineer types, right? And they look at this and they go, okay, yeah, 4, 4, 3, 4. But what, 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 what is it? Well, how do composers pick what they want? You know, what's the big difference? You know, they ask they ask you those questions a lot, and I think, well, let's play it. Let's find out what four four sounds like versus three four, and they begin to understand. Oh, ah, three four sounds a lot more what animated, right? More lively because those accents are coming in more often, right? Versus the four four. So you always get those very very inquisitive questions from the adults. <clears throat> And moving on to page 32 and 33, they get introduction here to the first few notes on the staff right in the middle. One of the beauties of this is that adults can't exactly share middle C with the same thumb, right? Thumbs are way too big, so the thumbs here are B and C, and they get a lot of uh, work here with tunes that they know. But if you look very carefully, it's not just reading C, D, E automatically. They've still incorporated letter names, right, and finger numbers because they're still somewhat dependent on that at this point. So they need a, a continuous review of that concept. Clock tower bells give them the added advantage of beginning to explore the pedal. And not having to do any lifting, just holding it through, hearing the resonance of the piano, and adults really enjoy that kind of added dimension in their playing. And of course, the transposition at the bottom. At this point, when they're doing this transposition, as a teacher, you still need to key them in on the fact that now where is the right hand? The right hand is by the what? The three black keys. Versus the right hand originally was by the two black keys. Right? And you still have to continue to bring that to their attention as they go along. Moving on to <clears throat> page 34. They kind of warm up the seconds. I love this middle of the range here that they're doing with the B, C, D, E. And a lot of times you see in, in materials, the focus is on C, D, E as an intro. But the inclusion of B here is very important because what are the two notes that most students mix up in the middle of the staff. B versus what? D. So they get that automatic introduction here when they work with the seconds of either hand. Catch a Falling Star is the first time they've had a longer piece. Besides the Amazing Grace, this is a 16-bar piece. No longer excerpts. They're getting the idea of influency as they go through here with the side note. Russian folk song has the addition. This is your page when you move it on here. <clears throat> this is page 36, the addition of the A in the bass staff. And what I like to key into here when they deal with this particular A is the middle three lines. I often recite A, C, E, middle three lines, A, C, E, and they remember that really well. Here is their first foray into the third, and understanding, oh, a block third, hmm. Line to line, right? Get a little understanding of that. What is it a prep for? It's a prep for something they want to play desperately later on, and that's chords, right? That introduction to chords via the third. <clears throat> Moving on to Midnight Rise. Sorry, I'm going through quickly, but I want to get through a lot of concepts. Um, at this point, you notice Legato is introduced. 
It's hard for us to introduce legato to a young child. Their hands are still in what? Their form looks to say, you know, um, they're very small and very wiggly, right? Adults, bigger hands, bigger bone structure, they're stronger. They can handle the concept of legato a little sooner. Okay. Um, midnight drive, wonderful 3-4 piece. Getting, again, working on that 3-4 ground. <laughs> It's a very effective piece, and not only can they work legato, but continue to emphasize the downbeat of three four, and actually start to play this piece somewhat quickly. And adults like kids also want to play what? Fast. Okay? It gives them that affirmation of moving forward in their study. As Randy mentioned, there is a technique and a theory page for every unit. Here is where you would introduce refinement of the legato. And with the right hand finger work exercise, it's not just legato they're working on, but as Randy was saying, learning about weight of the hands. So we produce the Nessa Forte with the wrist this idea moving up and playing more lightly in the upper register, moving up one more time with a heavier weight. So if you are worried about them getting locked in middle C, they can't get locked in middle C with exercises like this that have them exploring the range of the keyboard so early on. Moving on to unit three, Randy was touching on this a little bit earlier, but here is a very special moment because as we continue to think of um, building chords in their, in their um, technical study, they get to work with the anchor note of treble G, with the middle C, to begin working on that fifth in the ground of hand. And here you might encounter some problems, hopefully you can miss this along the way, but as they land on the fifth, sometimes there's a little tension that's in the hand if they try to grapple with it, and often you may have seen this in some of your students, but they land on the fifth, you see this kind of thing, where the fingers kind of go what? Upwards, right? So this is a perfect opportunity to do some tapping, perhaps, some very light tapping away from the keys, keeping that rounded hand position as they tap on the side tip of the thumb and on the bony tip of the uh, pinky, right, like this. And then, of course, it's a wonderful exercise to get them to learn what? Rotate back and forth, one to five, giving the hand a little bit of an arc as they rotate They still maintain that rounded hand. Chant of the Monks is a wonderful piece. What do adults want to do so badly in the first few weeks of study? <laughs> Play hands together. Okay, so this is a nice little cheat sheet, more or less. They have learned the names of the notes in the bass, but here they can have the left hand copy the right hand just by identifying the letter name notes that go back and forth between the two. Moving on to unit four, if we'll flip on over there. <clears throat> You have your warm up with the thirds, both blocked and broken at this point, continually to refine that third motion for the corner. New World Symphony theme. This is a thing that I find that most adults do know. I might, they might not you know, identify it by name, but usually when I sit down and demo it, they go, oh, yeah, 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 I heard that. But what's wonderful about this is that they get a chance to actually experience what? Finally. Harmony, right? A little harmony with the pedal. They really, really appreciate that. And they finally feel like they're playing grown up music, right? All right, continuing with a little bit of chords. Chord warm up. I think, oh, okay, here we go. One of the things I like about the new edition of the Adult One are the graphics. There's plenty of white space around things. You can easily identify material. I love the fact that the chord is introduced just as an icon there. C, E, G, no interruption of the staff, right? They can see immediately that it's stacked terms. They can see the spelling of it, C, E, G. And I love the identifying aspect of calling it a chord or calling it a what? a triad. They get both terms there. And of course, their C chord warm-up, 
allow them to continue to shake the fifth finger and the thumb first, and then stand on the third finger, all the while keeping this round handshake as you're moving up and down. I would really advise still using a good arm drop as they're working on this cord work. Really working on the forearm being the dropping mechanism for landing. And then, of course, at the bottom of the page, they get to see the CEG in action right on the base staff and in correlation to middle C. Okay, around this time, the adults are right, right around their third to fourth month of study. Perfect timing for what? Christmas carols, right? So if it's about November, December, they're very eager to start learning Christmas carols. And this falls into play very nicely with the use of the fifth as the accompaniment. And also the broken fifth in action as an accompanimental figure here. French minuet. Unit six is when eight notes come into play. And the wonderful hallmark of the new edition of the second of uh, the adult one. It's the fact that, as Randy was saying, there's audio support. The piano player asked, right? But now there is video support as well. And you'll find on the website that there are two videos per unit of Adult One. An introductory video that covers the concepts in general about the unit, and then also a video specifically for the technique page. So let's take a look at Randy introducing Unit 6 concepts. Unit 6, eighth notes. One, two, three, one, two, three. What if we subdivide those beats? One, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, and two, and three, and one, and two, and three. And while we're feeling the rhythm, listening to rhythm in our inner ear, we have that counting going on. And it's helpful for a performer not just to always count the main beats, but to subdivide those. One, and two, and three, and one, two three and one. Notice I'm not subdividing every single one. Sometimes that feels a little bit artificial, but sometimes just few subdivisions in their work. I like this one. One, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two. And why was that effective? Because three and one leads us over the bar line. You might keep in mind that the more you can flow over the bar line to the downbeat, that is to beat one, that gives a wonderful musicality to your playing. Let's give a listen to the French minuet here, where we had this feeling of a one, two, three, and one, two, three. This is going to help get through the complexity of the notes, because there's a lot of notes here. First, let's see the simplicity. How do we find the simplicity? Well, if we look at beat number one, the downbeat of each measure, we see it begins here on scale step five, then it goes to F, E, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So this descending scale is a bit of the architecture of the piece. We could even do more with that because if we think of the three and one, two, three and one, two, we're gonna see it leads to these pitches. So we have one, two, three and one, two, three and one, two, three and one, two, three, putting it all together. expressive minuet. Three, one, two, three, one, two, happy birthday. Oh, what do we have there? Notice that beat three came before the start of the piece. In other words, instead of a downbeat of one opening the piece, we're picking up what we could call a pickup note or an upbeat. Three, one, two, three, one, two. We see that same idea of an upbeat or a pickup note on taps on the previous page. So that was three and one, two, three, then four and one, two, three. Notice these are all chord tones. We learned something new here with chord tones. Root, third, and fifth. 
just a way of identifying those pitches of the chord tones. If I went up a step, root, third, fifth, hear this chord, root, third, fifth, root, third, fifth. So in our taps, we didn't start with the root, did we? We started down here, root, third, fifth, fifth to the root, then up to the third, and eventually up to the fifth. So root third fifth is convenient, it sounds good, it's good harmony stacked in thirds, but let's have a little spice now. Okay, here's a spicy chord. I like this one. In pop music, we just call it a sus chord. The formal name for it is the suspended fourth, because it's got scale step four in there instead of the third. So we get a fourth, which generally is going to resolve to the third. Suspended for suspended means it's hung over from an earlier chord. And then it resolves. But that's more in old fashioned terms, you might say, or in classical music and pop music. We're just going to use it as a pop chord in its own right, the sus four. We can give a listen to that in simple gifts. Back of the book, you have the two appendixes. That's the uh, major pentascales, 
that are given to them, and also the major crossing in our headgear. And for those of you that don't know about the uh, scaling cord book, the new scaling cord book, there's book one and now there's book two, they take these concepts, the cord arpeggios and the fence scale, and begin to have the students use them creatively through improvisatory activities, also with beautiful duet accompaniments, and learn about different stylizations and different techniques in which to put these actual into musical practice. So I've, I've really enjoyed using the scale and chord book alongside this particular book. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Randy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth mentioned the lead sheets. You know, these are really helpful for many students and adults in particular. I think they enjoy it. So we got the introduction there at level one, but level two with our music theory pages, each one is going to use a lead sheet. So every unit is another lead sheet, which takes them through a review of the concepts. For here, example, an F major scale in book two, but then the lead sheet takes us in London there air. Now we might think, okay, we'll do the triad, but notice the accompaniment. If we can show them root and fifth, right? If you want, you can do a root and then higher, not the higher so. So they really get a lot more going on here, right? Even on something like this, right? doesn't just have to be a black chord, but where we're helping them with their pleasure accompaniments, root fifths, and so on, we teach the natural uh, procedures for executing the lead sheet. You may have seen this uh, chart before. These are the many entry points for piano adventures. We'd like to stress that piano adventures for all ages, and each age has a different set of characteristics, not just motivations, and learning styles and characteristics, but also they have different objectives, don't they? For instance, at the early levels, the child isn't looking to become uh, to play the rock on and off their piano concerto. They just want to have some fun. They want to play. So the emphasis is being on the, on the playing, whereas the seven, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, they want to get some accomplishment as well as having fun. So there's a real mixture. If we move to the teenage beginner, the fun doesn't take a uh, in any importance right now, the student doesn't want to be embarrassed, right? You're starting late, so we don't say it's for the late beginner, it's for the accelerated, accelerated the teenage beginner. So this goes faster, it doesn't really go that much faster, but it seems like it goes faster with bigger pieces and really focusing on the accomplishment so the student's self-esteem stays intact and increases. What's the difference between accelerated piano adventures and adult piano adventures? Think of the objective. What's the goal for the adult? Well, we go back. A teenager, they've got 10 years ahead of them, right, to be able to put in the time, put in the effort, get their proverbial 10 years and 10,000 hours. The adult, well, it gets a little more problematic. It's not for future success and future competency, it's for the here and now, to finally become involved in music making, which they may have felt like they left out or were left out of in earlier years. So this idea of process and product, the product we're after is indeed the process of making music, which I alluded to earlier. So that conversational orientation, and importantly, getting ready to playing pieces while they're learning to play, that playing of the pieces is so important. So the supplements then here have become enormously successful. We apologize for being so late in getting supplements for the adult method, but we've got them here for you now. And in your pack, you've got the classics book, the classics book, I noticed the table of contents. I'm going to blow that up a little bit here. There's three sections. The first one is easy arrangements with simple harmony. So we need to get them going right from those early reading lessons in unit two, playing some themes that are familiar, but yet easy to play. Going to section two here, notice it's the one, four, five chords in the key of C. So this is much like the chord time books. And then in the section three, chord one, four, five in the key of G. So to take a peek here, 
we get uh, uh, and notice the harmony of the chorus, very understandable for them, very simple, and um, yet effective and aesthetic. And then here we're into the uh, next unit with the key of G, a little Puccini. And the process of music making is so important. We want to be focusing not on virtuosity, but what can the student do and have as a, as a goal with that plan? It's not speed, as Elizabeth said, but what we're looking for then is the aesthetics, the expressivity. So lots of musicality.
Okay, now here we are, key of C, <coughs> one, four, and five, so. Uh, right? Nancy was teaching his one, four, and five chords to a student just two days ago, which is playing it in uh, E, right? So the student goes like this, she goes, one chord, and then she knows the C sharp right at the top, right? With the little fifth finger, so she goes, four chord. <laughs> Fine, sorry. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, that's good, but we don't have to move our whole body, we just slide it. I said, no, I like to do this. <laughs> but it gave me an idea, you know, you think of, you know, one, one, four, and five. You know, five is a dominant, it's a fifth dominant, isn't it? And the subdominant doesn't mean it's a step forward. The subdominant means it's a fifth below, doesn't it? So we go, we have our one and our five, and then sometimes the composers balance it out, we go a little bit. To the subdominant instead, right? And then to one. So we get five, one, and I mean four, one, and five. Like on either side. So let's flip it around. We don't have to think in fifths. Let's think in fours. Because it's a little easier, right? So here's our one, four, and the. Right? Let's go four and down. There's our five. So one, go up a four, and red the four, right? Go back to the one. Output. There's a five and back to one. And so here we go four, right? And back to one. And then the five and back to one. Okay, so let's get two, three, and this land is your land. <laughs> one, and then we go, and then the five and back to one. So we get the sense of the chord progression, ready? Two, three, go, up, 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 four. Give it a good workout of understanding and fun. Jurassic Park theme. Here we're doing something a little more in our adult chords. We're going to add the six chord. So if we have our one, four, five, we also have six, don't we? Very important now because the six chord is so popular in music now. All the hip hop is always using this six. So we've got a number of things we use. Great set of chords there based on the six, right? So we can do a number of chord progressions through here. Let me see if I can straighten this up. And notice, here we go. We've got a writer standard from the 60s, 50s and 60s, kind of this one, six, four, five. But then bringing it a little more up to date, we get what all these hip hop songs are made out of here. One, five, then six. It's like a truncated pocket of organ, isn't it? And four. So let's put a little up in a pattern, but it's, let's do it on the step forward bit. Not bad, hey? If we wanted to do more, you get your dance. But it's the same, same chord progression. Okay, here we got current song.
could get that to our kids also. I think it's probably a good idea. So well, here's a little Ed Sheer, and also so we're seeing in with the, uh, uh, there's quite current music as well as some oh, great pieces from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so forth. In your pack, you've got the scale book two. Scale book one, you may recognize five of your scales. We can teach you the best with improvisation opportunities to all 12 high figure keys, little mini classic pieces that they transpose to 12 keys. So it's a fabulous workout for the students at level one, 2A. And uh, 2B, 3A, here you get into the scale book two. Taking a look, we have the scale exercise here. First playing the scale in the uh, uh, parallel and contrary motion. But I want to highlight the challenges. We throw in a challenge here for each scale. And this challenge is so important that it reorients the scale instead of just thinking that, okay, I've got, uh, I've got this pattern of notes that I have to use like a technical exercise. We're saying in G major, in G major it has this important leading tone, doesn't it? And the leading tone that is well with that step five dominant. So we want to understand this scale really intimately. So we need to know step five, we need to know step seven as well as step one. So notice how the challenges point that out. Five fingers, but then it crosses over the leading tone underneath. And then the leading tone above. Left hand. Five, five, right? Because the dominant isn't just five steps, but it's underneath as well. Okay, so check that out for G. Now let's transpose it to the key of C. Leading tone, jump on it. And here we go. Five, right? And here we go. So whatever we can play in the key of C, we're going to take it through many more keys. Here's another example. There's our challenge post up. Notice leading tone moving to tonic, and then here tonic, or the dominant, dominant. Key of A major, this is another example. All of these are effective and important. I love this A major one, because not only do we do the A scale, right, slowly at first and then hands together and so on. But notice this. In right hand. So we get this. circular motion, but notice we're anchoring five and one, five, one, five, one, five, one, five, one, five, one, five, one, five. And then we're going to transpose that. So we start taking these warm-ups through all of the many keys here. As you move into more, we're adding more and more keys. So very, very effective warm-ups. We're understanding the importance of scales. Not just as a finger exercise, really, for technique, but more importantly, for the contribution the scale makes in terms of being a palette of sounds that the composer uses. Taking through minor, notice here the minor scales. Um, and then what do we have? We take these little power chords. So they get the one, seven, six, down to the five and one. And imagine learning this in all these different keys, transposing is very, very effective. Here we take some of the same pop ideas we did with the adult. We're taking one, four, five, and one, right? But how about if we bring the left hand coming down? So we go down to the four below, and then we can go to the sixth chord, right? And then we can do our heart and soul, and then we can do our hip hop. And then we can take those into a couple of patterns that we'll do next. So we take those, top it out, do some work on two hands, taking each of these as a chord progression. And then working through here, we've got a little bit more progressions. So we get this little cadence, right? And that takes us to what? One to five, seven. Okay, can we transpose it? So 
So now we have happy birthday, right? And all peace. So no more embarrassment. Our students can play happy birthday in any by getting down to the elemental structure and transposal. The more I teach, the more I find that the students who transpose a lot are the really good musicians. So don't wait until they're older to transpose, transpose early. Easier when they transpose early. Give them the building blocks, and as you know in Canto Adventures, we're all about taking the building blocks, relating it always to the literature they're playing. So they're playing a the literature that goes along with the theory that they understand. And then giving them the expressive tools of touch, gesture, so they can do Hey, it's great to see all of you, and we look forward to seeing you down at the booth. Stay in touch, new website that has just gone up for PianoMakers.com is a bit of a facelift. So we'll see you online, and we'll see you at the booth next year. And Tuesday.